Okay, I think we are already 36 participants. Maybe we could start already the session. It's my pleasure to welcome everyone to the afternoon section of multi-messenger astrophysics. So we have the first speaker is Razmik Mirzoyan on the reset detection of GRB satellite electron volt energies. So Razmik, please, you could start the presentation. We see your screen already. Thank you very much, Narek. I would like to thank uh, the organizers of this meeting, and uh, first of all, Professor Morofini. And um, I'm happy to make a presentation about uh, our relatively recent work. It will be uh, devoted about, um, to recent discoveries of gamma ray burst uh, teravolt electron uh, teravolt energies. So. Um, I, I think I will say a few words about the gamma ray bursts, very compact. These are um, very violent, distant explosions in the universe, gamma ray bursts. And then on the right upper corner, you can see a cartoon which shows um, some of the main processes involved in it. And uh, gamma ray bursts uh, are known to uh, belong to two populations. One conditionally is called short, and the other one's a long burst. And then the borderline between two is two seconds. Short, short are those which are shorter than two seconds. And the mechanism for this uh, burst seems to be distinctly different. So while uh, for the long burst, uh, one assumes that uh, the responsible are massive star collapses, which produce ultra relativistic jets. In the case of um, Short bursts, um, one believes it is consistent with a binary neutron star merger. So, um, until recently, there was no detection whatsoever of gamma ray bursts in the tera electron energy band. And then the highest energy photon was one single photon uh, from measured by Fermi Lat instrument at 95 GeV in the year 2013, so uh, from, from the very strong GRB in April 27. So there is uh, no very strict division in time between um, prompt phase and afterglow, and then prompt phase of a GRB is characterized. Uh, uh, now I will talk about the long GRBs. It's, uh, prompt phase is characterized by structured emission. Uh, which can take uh, from seconds to many minutes, and it is followed by afterglow. So in the past, there were a few hints just uh, from um, GRBs measured by um, few um, instruments, which are now only of historical importance. I cite here a measurement from the aerobic instrument, uh, which claimed um, measure a GRB event above uh, 20 tera electron volts. Uh, this was the event uh, which happened 1992 on 25th of September. I was part of this experiment, Hegra experiment, I already belong to it. And then um, I will not go to, uh, into the detail to save your time, but I give you uh, some main information about this event. From today's point of view, when 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 I look again to, to this event, uh, I would, uh, with high level of confidence, claim this was not a gamma ray burst event. It was some sporadic event. So, 2.7 uh, sigma is not very high to claim signal. Anyway, I think we understood it already back in time now. Another, another event was uh, from the so-called Milagrito detector, which was a very, very small detector, 42 meters times 42 meters. It was a predecessor of Milagro detector, which itself was a predecessor for a Fock detector. And then they claimed to see some uh, GRB event, maybe. And there are two publications, one in the year 2000, the other one in 2003. And if you look to details of uh, publications, you can see, especially in the second publication, the big skepticism of the authors by themselves, who could see that there is much, um, so let's say, by the order or two orders of magnitude higher energy emission um, um, uh, allocated at the GV energies compared to X-ray energy domain, which was not probable. So, so it was clear that this is not a real event. So these are just of historical importance, that's why I mentioned. 
Uh, nowadays, there are uh, several um, instruments which are operating at around electron wave energies, and then uh, these are uh, actually crop telescopes. Uh, Veritas has Hawk, uh, Veritas has Magic, but also a water churning of detector Hawk, and the Lasso, which is a complex detector. And all of them, they are pursuing uh, this um, program to measure transients uh, um, like gamma ray bursts, gravitational wave sources, neutrino target of opportunities, um, and so on. So um, there is one distinct difference between these type of detectors. While for wide angle detectors like, uh, like Hawk, it is a um, very easy game just uh, to measure GRV. It just needs to happen in, in its uh, field of view. Now for the narrow field of view instruments like uh, actual telescopes, uh, this is uh, very, very um, improbable. So, what we are doing, uh, we are um, tuning to satellite uh, alerts, uh, alerts from satellite missions, um, typically in X-ray range. And then, um, then we, we build our telescopes uh, with a fast loop possibility, and then we start tracking this alerted position. This is how things are working. And then uh, nowadays, all the ICTs are optimizing their operation for such a, um, a way of slowing. And then, um, uh, Nevertheless, uh, there are differences in the design. Uh, so let's say the fastest one until now is a magic telescope. Uh, already in 1998, it was designed um, to follow GRBs. And so we were chasing the problem when the telescopes were built for a long time. So there were no results until recently. And then um, we were uh, uh, lucky. And then uh, I will talk about this good luck. Yeah. So in the issue of uh, Nature from 21st of November, uh, four articles appeared um, in the same issue devoted to um, uh, GRBs. And then two articles uh, were published by the Magic Collaboration. Uh, these articles were devoted to the Gamma Ray Burst 19014C, uh, which was the first ever uh, Gamma Ray Burst measured uh, in the Terra Electro World Energy Band. Uh, details I, I will show a little bit later on. Um, in, this, um, in the first paper, we, we showed the technical uh, measurements and that this is not a, a synchrotron emission. I will say a few words later on. But in the second paper, I think we studied the spectral energy distribution from this primary um, uh, burst by using uh, data of multiple instruments. And then uh, I will come to this point a little bit uh, uh, later on, a few slides later. Also, our colleagues from the S collaboration uh, measured uh, some signal from uh, GRB 180720P, a marginal signal on the level of uh, five sigma. And, but uh, the measurement was very interesting. Uh, I will describe you the things about it. And then all these three articles were accompanied by a uh, uh, kind of uh, comment uh, article from Bing Chang uh, about extreme emissions seen from gamma ray bursts. And these are the magic telescopes. Many of you may know about them, um, at least in relation with uh, GRB 1901-14C. Um, so this is, is a twin telescope system with 17 meter diameter and 17 meter focal length. They are separated by um, 85 meters. They are located at a height of um, 2,200 meters on the Canary Island of La Palma. Um, on this height, uh, there is a European North uh, Observatory. So there are uh, over 20 telescopes located there. On the right insert, you can see the imaging camera, uh, open imaging camera, which consists of 1,039 photomultiplier tubes. And uh, uh, lower right corner, you can see uh, laser indicators attached to mirrors for adjusting the mirrors. So uh, uh, there is a lot of automatic operation in this telescope. Um, here, I, I would like to show you a short movie. This is uh, how it is uh, designed for this operation. So this is a very uh, designed uh, to have a fast slow mode in order to catch uh, GRB possibly in the prompt uh, emission phase. You should think about that uh, the idea of the satellite was originally to go in the commercial phase. And then with time we learned more and more, but we can see uh, how during daytime when we do a test, we can follow an arbitrary position in the sky. Uh, we can catch it within 20, 25 seconds. 
So in the middle, you can see the so-called experimental house, where we are doing information from both telescopes is coming via optical fibers. And these are high-tech telescopes with a lot of new technology. For example, signals are coming in an analog uh, way, uh, but uh, uh, we fed them into optical fibers by using uh, laser modulators. So there are a lot of uh, fancy things, some of them which became standard for the discipline. So um, we are using a fully automatic system for following the transient uh, alerts with magic. And then um, uh, this includes a lot of software development, but also some hardware and the safety was always in the first place because uh, when a GRB alert comes at an arbitrary time and software is checking if this is appropriate for us or not, we have our own criteria and I think uh, a lot of things should happen. So I think uh, it, uh, it will lock the fence around the telescope. Uh, we, we should be sure that there is no human being around the telescope. And then um, I think while the telescope starts moving in a very fast mode uh, to, to, to the um, target position, it does a lot of things like adjusting the mirrors to the new position. All the mirrors are sitting on stepping motors. And then um, it's uh, closing the files of previous measurement, calibrating the telescope uh, pedestals and so on. So. And then uh, for polishing this um, way of operation, we, we, were issuing, we were issuing fake alerts for the uh, shift personnel once uh, during the shift period, which is typically three weeks or three and a half weeks. And then this has helped us to debug the system. So um, just a little bit of statistics, uh, GRB follow-ups. Uh, so you can see that in the past years, uh, we, we could follow 105 GRBs. And then typically we were reacting to eight to 10 GRBs per year. Uh, state of observations uh, of GRBs, I think we started uh, with uh, after the upgrade of the telescope in the year 2013 with higher sensitivity. And then um, and just um, we, we reacted to four GRBs, which uh, had a redshift below 1.5. On the left lower corner, you can see the redshift distribution of sources uh, where, where we got uh, the alert. And then on the right uh, lower corner, you can see the zenith angle of, the, uh, of these GRBs when they happen. This is an important parameter for us because if the zenith angle is very large, then the threshold of the telescope goes higher up. And then detection rates uh, are lower and then maybe significance of the signal will be difficult to obtain just because of statistics. And then you can see on the x-axis on the same plot time delay from the uh, start of the um, GRB. This is just in, just in order to get an impression. So and then on this list, uh, I show a um, table with uh, four GRBs. And then uh, three of them are of short type. Short type are those uh, below two seconds. Uh, one of them, uh, this is the GRB that uh, I will talk uh, more about it. This is 1901-14C, it's of a long time. So I think uh, if I go to statistics, uh, it is interesting uh, only for specialists uh, because we are trying to learn the lessons. Uh, when can we measure GRB, how and so on. So I'm not sure if it is so important for you. And then um, you know, good luck happened on the late evening or night of uh, 14th of January 2019. And then we got a signal from this uh, GRB. We followed a swift alert. And then uh, I got a call from La Palma from the swift crew. And then they used to tell that they, they can see a signal growing up from the online analysis on the monitor. And they were bluffed if this is real or what's going on, because uh, there was no time to think about. Everything happens automatically. And the operator cannot uh, interfere, should not interfere. Anyway, so I think uh, from the online analysis uh, on that evening, we saw something like a 20 sigma signal. And then uh, just uh, within a few hours, I, I issued uh, with the help of my colleagues, after an uh, exchange of 64 emails and many telephone calls, uh, in the middle of the night, I issued an uh, astronomy telegram and then uh, GCN circular about this detection, which you can see here. Big uh, signal to measured from this object. So, um, our measurements, I think, um, started after 50, 50 seconds after the 
uh, start of the GRB, but uh, for technical reasons, we are using uh, data uh, starting one minute lamp after the uh, GRB. So um, I think uh, the measurements were a little bit problematic because the moon was up, but uh, during the past years, uh, long ago, we learned how to measure during the presence of moon, which is somewhat unusual for air chain telescopes. Also, the, the um, observations and angle was about 60 degrees, and, uh, but it did not bother us because we developed also uh, the technique to observe uh, sources even to zenith angle of 80 degrees, almost to the horizon. And then uh, it took us some time to realize why it happened during the moon at large zenith angles. And although the explanation is very primitive, uh, nevertheless, I think we were bluffed a little bit. Um, it happens to, um, at the large zenith angles uh, because then solid angle is large. So I think your chance probability is large to catch a GRV. And it happens during the partial moon time because observation time is higher. Typically, an actual and telescope observes uh, 1,000 hours per year during dark nights. But if you add up uh, partial moon time, then you can you can increase this resource by another 30 percent. So we had uh, both pleasures, yeah. Uh, partial moon, that's any tumbles. So, but we were prepared for it, so there was no problem. So, um, uh, we, we managed to, because of these two factors, uh, partial moon and the large zenith angle, our, our observ observation threshold turned out to be 200 GV, relatively high, uh, while uh, we can measure sources above 30 or 50 GB, depending on the trigger. And you can see a little bit statistics. It's an average analysis. This is not the best analysis. This is what entered the conservative uh, into publication. This result has been obtained by 10 independent analysis, I should mention. People were very enthusiastic. Typically, for people um, in different locations, analyze the same data independently. In this case, uh, 10 people jumped onto this. Yeah. So we measured something like 50, 60 sigma signal from this source. And then um, I, if I go to, to the next page, I think uh, I, I showed that the detection rate of gamma rays from uh, GRV 19 c on the left view graph. And then uh, on the right, I show um, the detection rate of uh, very high energy gamma rays from Crab Nebula. Crab Nebula is the strongest steady source in our galaxy. Typically, we measure six events per minute from Crab Nebula, let's say at a threshold about 200 GB. Now let's look in this movie what's ha what has happened during the detection. So if you, um, I should mention that the uh, y-axis of the Crab Nebula is uh, uh, <clears throat> multiplied by factor 10 in order to be able to show what's going on. So essentially there was background free detection of gamma rays. We had a huge rate of uh, gamma rays on the left one. From the GRB, while Crab Nebula was barely moving, and then our strongest galactic source was uh, barely visible. It's barely visible on this plot. Anyway, this was a cool thing. And then um, uh, I, I think uh, when we estimated the highest rate for the first 30 seconds, we saw that uh, the intensity of GRB was 130 times higher than that from the Crab Nebula. And then some of us were speculating what could have happened if you would have uh, touched this GRB uh, uh, just uh, in, in hence from the beginning in the prompt phase, then most probably all the system would uh, saturate. Uh, but this did not happen yet, maybe in future. So our colleagues uh, from HES uh, reported for four months after our detection of our detailed uh, GCN messages. In Bologna, there was a CTA symposium in May 2019, and they, they showed some uh, that they managed uh, to measure five sigma signal from another GRB, which happened uh, earlier than our GRB. But uh, in my impression, I think they, they started reanalyzing uh, the data after seeing that we could successfully measure gamma rays um, uh, from a GRB. And then, um, this is uh, what you can see. I think uh, the remarkable thing about this detection is that they, they saw the signal 10, 10 hours at, uh, after the uh, inset of the GRB. So this is, uh, I think, very impressive. 
And then uh, this is a uh, um, uh, uh, detection of this uh, GRB um, by different instruments. You can you can see different instruments here. And then uh, by the red dot, uh, you can see in the right middle uh, place on the view graph, you can see detection of uh, this collaboration single point here. They may manage to measure signal between 100 and 400 GBs. So um, we, we were preparing our telescopes uh, well in order to measure gamma ray signal uh, long ago, um, but uh, I think uh, providing very low threshold of detection, uh, keeping in mind we are going to measure gamma ray burst above 20 GB, 30 GB, or something like this. So we were optimizing everything that we should happen to order of minute higher energies. So we're trying to digest that this was a surprise. But then we digested the surprise, and now we know better what, what, what one should uh, anticipate. So this is, uh, um, on this view graph, on the, on the x-axis, you can see the time after the um, onset of the GRB and the measured by magic flux. And then you can see that we started measuring, uh, in reality, I think, uh, data acquisition system, DAQ, started at 50, 58 seconds after the onset. So we missed these nice peaks, uh, which we saw, for example, uh, swift uh, mission. Yeah? And then we, saw, we, we, we could see this smooth decay. And then on, on this view graph, you can see um, the um, afterglow phase of this GRB, which we detected. And then you can see that the magic data shown in uh, red dots uh, goes in parallel with uh, this magenta line showing the Fermi lab. Uh, measurement and then XRT measurement between one and 10 uh, kilo electron watt. Already here, you can see some correlation. And then on this view graph, you can see what, what did we measure. And then when, when we normalize it to the extragalactic background light correction, how the spectrum becomes. So we used uh, um, uh, one of the trustworthy, uh, widely used um, EBL uh, correction methods. And then uh, what is interesting at one tera electron volt, the MRI signal was uh, attenuated uh, by 1,000 times. Despite this, we measured signal until 2 tera electron volt. In, in our uh, recent publication, we, we could prove this 2, uh, two tera electron volt signal. So this is, this is just to show that the signal goes to 1 TV, 2 TV. It's of uh, technical help, and then that it is not a, um, it is well above the sign so called burn-off limit. So it is of different origin. And then um, this uh, different origin, I think, uh, has been discussed uh, in our uh, second paper in Nature. Uh, second in the sense uh, the papers appeared simultaneously, but uh, here we were working with a lot of instruments, and then two dozen of instruments, and you can see data from very, very different instruments shown on the, on the view graph, uh, where on the x-axis is shown time after the onset of uh, burst. And then on the y axis is shown uh, flux in um, hertz per centimeter square per second. And then um, we can see a very, very full picture here, a complicated picture. And then uh, when analyzing this picture, I think uh, here it is interesting, I think, uh, to see a um, lot of instruments uh, participating in this measurement. I will jump uh, to save time uh, who did what. But uh, as a result, I, I would like to show you this view graph, which is a remarkable one, because uh, it shows uh, these uh, two, um, two amps. Yeah? You see on the right hand time, you can see a terra electron volt uh, energy is a new hump, and this is a uh, brand new. I think uh, it was uh, long speculated that maybe GRBs are emitting terra electron volt gamma rays, but because there was no measurement, it was, it's uh, remained as a speculation. Now we proved, and the situation is very similar to active galactic nuclei when in 1991, people telescope uh, by measuring signal from the Mark Adam 421, showed that there is not only synchrotron emission, there is also emission of terra electron gold bands and the second hump is popping up. So this is a remarkable feature. And then it shows that there is more energy in the GRB and that uh, it was um, uh, underestimated the uh, total power of GRB, and then I think it speaks about the mechanism. So, um, 
Recently, we did another study based on this data about the Lorentzian virus violation. And then um, I, I'm sure that uh, most of you know uh, details about uh, Lorentzian virus violation, what is it? And then to put it in a very simple way, um, I would say that uh, um, the speed of uh, energy particles under certain conditions uh, uh, could depend on the energy. So it is uh, one theory, and then um, nobody knows um, how, how real is this, or uh, it has a link to reality, but I think these theories exist. And then uh, when, when, when one does a simple calculation or estimation, I think uh, one can see that um, by assuming that, uh, for example, two photons are uh, emitted uh, promptly at the same time, at the same moment from some object at very large distance, because that photons travel very long time, let's say billions of years, uh, billions of years they are traveling, I think uh, they get, uh, if their speed is a little bit different, then you will get a uh, slight somewhat they are different detection times for these uh, two photons. And then I think this can be estimated from this uh, lower right corner formula, simple formula, this is the time difference between two photons that you will measure. If their energy difference, uh, delta E is, uh, let's say, E, for example, two tera electron volt and lower energy 100 GV, and this, this will be your delta E, and then this is normalized to um, uh, quantum gravity energy scale, and uh, the parameter D here stands for, for the distance. So it's um, enclosed information on the source detector coming distance. And there is some parameter uh, a, S uh, and then uh, N, and then uh, depending on um, first order Lorentz invariance violation or second order, I think people are typically considering this too. And this is a simple cartoon to show that uh, uh, when, when a particle has higher energy, this top one, the red one, it interacts stronger with the vacuum while, while moving forward. So because of strong interaction, it is old by maybe this interaction and slows down. So this is kind of easy way to explain, let's say, um, on the level of our intuition, you know, what's happening. Um, and then I think uh, you can see this uh, um, on these tables, the measurements, what uh, has been done and the evaluated results paper appeared uh, recently in FieldsRef. Um, on the, on the lower, in the lower table, you can see um, you know, what has been measured, what are the outstanding numbers as of today. And then uh, these are um, GRB uh, 090510, Markana 541, and then GRB 1901-14C, so three different GRBs. And then they are uh, some, somewhat very different from each other. So our colleagues from S, for example, measured signal from Markana 541 until 20 TV. Well, in GRB, we measured until 2 TV. So the, here they get factor 10 in the energy, energy difference. Yeah? Um, and then the redshift, but uh, we get a uh, redshift much higher than compared to Markana 541. So in the end, I think our results are comparable to those uh, found out by S. Um, but the best number from uh, uh, a linear, um, um, you know, linear approximation of uh, uh, Lorentz virus violation is coming from uh, uh, Fermi lab collaboration from the GRB on N510. Yeah. But in the quadratic approach, our numbers are as good as uh, from competitors. So we are from the uh, frontier line. So I do not have time much to go here, but uh, looking through this uh, view graph again, you can see that. Uh, um, this, you can see this smooth curve, and this smooth curve was not so helpful for uh, Laurentian virus violation studies because uh, there was no feature here. And then I think uh, we did intelligent studies. Um, those of you who are interested can have a look into the paper. But if there would have been a bump or structure or so, something that we could have had in our hands, I think the limits would have become much better. But this is not the case um, as long as you measure smooth afterglow. Still, I think in the quadratic approach, I think we, we have a very, very interesting uh, result. The other GRB, um, I think uh, another GRB has been measured by the HESP collaboration one year ago. Um, and then all what we know about this GRB that uh, I think... Uh, uh, they measured it four hours, 20 minutes after the onset of GRB, but it's a very nearby. 
from the redshift of 0 0.07. And then um, I, I, I think they claim that they have signaled uh, stronger than uh, five sigma. Then we are tuned to see results of measurement of this GRB again um, after low phase has been measured there. And then here I want uh, I want to come to the end of my presentation, and then I would like to talk to say a, a few sentences about the GRB, which happened on uh, 16th of August. Uh, I'm sorry, sorry, 21st of August, um, 2016, four years ago. And then um, at, um, I think uh, you can see from from the shown sentences that uh, there are just 20 events detected in the GRB. Uh, GEV band, and then uh, this is a short GRB. I think uh, catching short GRB is um, you know, some kind of exclusive thing by, uh, by a narrow, narrow field of uh, view detector because somehow it takes uh, at least a um, maximum two seconds or shorter. Now we can we can look a little bit to the details, and then. Um, um, this GRB um, is residing at the redshift of uh, 0 0.162. So um, this uh, GRB emission was followed by several telescopes and their detections reported from radio, optical infrared, soft X-rays. Um, um, I think Fermi lat in the GV range uh, produced limit. And the optical infrared observation clearly revealed the presence of a kilonova. So this is what we believe about the uh, short, uh, short GRBs, uh, Newton star measures. And then um, I think it, this, um, it was dominating the emission at about one day. So after, we, after the burst trigger, it takes about 13 seconds for satellite to generate the alert and to send to, to Earth. So we got this uh, alert after 13 seconds. So it took us only 11 seconds to through the magic telescope and start observing this uh, GRB position. So 24 seconds, it, uh, it was the fastest ever we did. Uh, and then, uh, sorry, you have two minutes left. Just yeah, I'm finishing you. now. I think this is, okay, uh, I, I, will, I will finish with this one, yeah, thank you. So I think uh, T90 of this GRB was believed to be half a second or one second, depending on the detector. And then uh, weather conditions initially were not so good, and there was a bright moon. And but still, I think uh, when we did the honest analysis, we came down to three sigma. Here, I should uh, I should tell you that um, um, initially we got a, sig a signal of four point seven sigma from this source, but it was shifted a little bit from the source position by zero point zero five degrees. And then we did a lot of studies to understand why the position is shifted by this uh, amount. And then it turned out our today's explanation is that uh, um, uh, in the presence of a weak signal, we did a lot of Monte Carlo studies. This could happen that the peak position of the signal is uh, shifted by a small amount. But uh, uh, I think here you can see uh, the excess, which is quite small. And then uh, this is the honest significance. I think uh, the paper is uh, just ready for submission. It is under collaboration review. But I should mention that this result is produced by using the standard analysis technique. And then we are using now novel analysis technique, which reveals higher signal level. And uh, this work is under preparation. I think uh, these are takeaway um, messages from these detections, but I will stop here. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Rasmik, for this very detailed and very interesting presentation. We enjoyed it very much about the GRBs. Uh, we have a time for some questions. Is there any question from the participants? Well, if not, I, I have a question. Uh, I, I, I mean, uh, since now it is confirmed that the, there is the second bump in the GRB spectrum, what do you think when there will be this next generation of Cherenkov telescopes coming like LST or CTA, what would be the number of the GRBs detected per day? How it will change the, the field, I mean? Well, I think it's a complicated uh, question. Norik. I think um, I can do some arithmetics. Uh, yes. I, can, I, I will need to communicate it to you. I cannot uh, answer now online, but I can bring some consideration to, about this. So some of my colleagues are very optimistic that uh, with CTA, one will measure much more many GRBs. 
I I am skeptical about this. So I I think uh, not very much will change. So what will happen? I think we will measure these GRBs in the afterglow phase regularly. So this will become a regular uh, type of sources for actually for telescopes. But their number will stay relatively low. Uh, and you see if um, if uh, some GRBs could be measured 10 hours after onset of uh, uh, GRB, then I think uh, it makes um, uh, quite realistic with the current sensitivity to catch up this uh, uh, GRB after glows at a late time. So in this way, I could imagine that the uh, number will increase and then steadily will increase. It will not explode. And uh, why I'm saying uh, that uh, I do not anticipate much more many uh, GRBs to be measured by uh, CTA compared to current instruments, because you see what is happening. I think uh, GRBs are not happening uh, as a rule at the lowest threshold. So you make an instrument with 20 GB threshold, but the GRB is happening uh, at large zenith angle and the, the presence of the moon. So in the end, your threshold is uh, 200 GV or 100 GV. So this is limiting your reach in the space. So I think the volume will not increase that much. It will still increase because I think uh, you will have relatively lower threshold, but uh, no revolution will happen. So I think, and uh, be, I think before CTA telescopes will start producing such data, I think current instruments, active instruments, will still measure some GRBs. So you know very well that uh, whenever GRB is happening, I think people are keen to direct the telescopes immediately. Um, let's say an, an, uh, uh, an average number is uh, something like two GRBs per year. Yeah, that we can measure with such telescopes, but uh, with afterglow, maybe the number will uh, will be around this number, could be slightly higher, and then it will stay so until we will invent a wide angle instrument. I think that can measure at 100 GB or 50 GB or even lower. I see. Very good. Thank you very much, Rasmik. Indeed, the, the the observation of the magic or the has already were revolutionary to find this second component. So. There is a lot of already to be done for the GRB science, right? Yeah. Yes. Okay. There is any question from the participants? I just want if to no. make a short comment. I think I did yes. not. Uh, I did not stop on, on the theories which were extensively shown here. Uh, but uh, my colleagues uh, uh, around Remo Ruffini are uh, pursuing because of. I reason, but uh, I think they were uh, shown extensively. So I just showed things uh, from the narrow point of view, how we do see it uh, from the side of the experiment. Thank you very much, Razmik. Thanks once more. So now we move to uh, the next speaker, which is Vladimir Lipunov, Central GRB engine from early multi-messenger observations. So please, could you share your screen and start the presentation? I think your microphone is muted. If you could unmute, okay. Yes. Okay, now I see that your microphone is unmuted and we see oh. the video on your camera. Okay, I, I will start. Okay, very good. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Raimo and all people for the, the possibility to talk, to give a talk at this very nice traditional conference, the Deutsch conference. Uh, today, I would like to say about the central engine and uh, multi-messenger observation. The voice is good, yes? Okay. Uh, my talk is partly uh, observational and partly theoretical. So, the before, uh, the first part is observational, second, theoretical, and after that, I come to the observation uh, for some 
the theoretical testing. Okay. Uh, uh, that is my co-authors from the different country, the main number from Russia, but from different city. Because uh, today I would like to say in general about the master global master network results. And uh, uh, by the way, that is a very old photos of the relativistic astrophysical depart department of uh, maybe I can I can move this, but yes, this is good now. Maybe yes. No? Hello? Yes. Oh, okay. Okay. Yes, yes, we, we see your that slide. Is our we can... You see, Jakob Zildo is at the middle of 1980s years. He founded a new uh, laboratory. He has uh, three or four laboratories in Moscow. There's Leonid Grishuk, Mikhail Sarzan, the general of relativity, theoretical people. This me, this uh, Nikolai Ivanovich Shakura. Uh, Sergei Simakov, uh, Sergei Kapitian is a professor of the Missouri University now, and Sasha Petrov. That is uh, young, more or less young people near the teacher. Okay. And uh, come back to the observation, uh, started from observation. And uh, <coughs> The global master network now occupied several very important longitude and latitude. You see three points at the near equator, but the south, south hemisphere, and uh, a lot of points in Russia because weather is not good, but we have the several telescopes very near and so. And uh, this telescope can ob uh, observe in different way. The first way is, is the discovery, uh, the, the survey, survey of the sky and discovery object. Another type of observation is the alert observation. Today you'll be discussing exactly uh, alert observation because the main object, our object is gamma ray burst. And you see, we discovered about 10 different op optical transient on the sky. And uh, just a moment. Uh, uh, something wrong. Just a moment. OK. You see here the, some part of discovery tower transient. You see the course of global uh, geographically you can uh, discover the object on the whole sky. You see the uh, south sky, that is the northern sky, with the Milky Way, you see. And you can see here different objects from the solar planets come to the very higher. 10 billion year light year from the Earth. Okay. And uh, here I would like to show you our interaction between different telescopes, uh, red uh, arrow, arrow maybe, arrow maybe, red arrows is uh, alert from the gamma ray observatory, well known, but we, when we, discovered some object, we give alerts from different, very large telescope in the world. But uh, last uh, three or four years, four years, we, no, no, five years, we started to observe different alerts from the big, very big physical experiments you see the gravitational wave, that's Ligo-Virgo collaboration, and we discovered 
independent, we have this independent discovery of the Kilo Nova. Uh, I'm sorry. Ah. And uh, we uh, interact, uh, we have the very, a lot of alerts from the ice cube. And once we detected the very close to the uh, optical, optical changing of the blazars, uh, I'm sorry, this, uh, I would like to show maybe people knows this paper recently appears in Astrophysics Journal and uh, optical reveals strong evidence for high energy neutrino. And uh, 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 recently we um, participated and worked with the uh, fast radio bars and uh, this preliminary, I show preliminary our very huge uh, run of observation, optical observation with higher time resolution, uh, very well known fast radio bars, this one. One, this is recurrent radio box, and uh, we receive a lot of a lot of results, uh, and uh, we received 150,000 images, and uh, maybe now in the preparation. This no, no, this paper is prepared, but we send to the strategic journal this paper. But come back to gamma ray birds. But, uh, gamma ray birds observation uh, based on the gamma center network. You see new slides, not maybe. Oh, no, no, no. Just a moment. You see here. Okay. Uh, this well known site, gamma center network, and now we receive about uh, during the one year. You, we have the telescopes and we have the about 1,000 alerts pointing during the one year. So you see our telescope is very light to binocular. Uh, this uh, only one and more polarizator telescope, wide field polarization telescope. And we have three axes. When we have alerts, we can uh, take simultaneously two images in different polarization or different colors, uh, the interesting object. Very, very quickly presented. You see the observation, uh, your observation of gamma ray, gamma ray girls, uh, five or six years ago, we, we asked, we uh, come to the leader of the Yule observation, that is our observation, that is from the Alan Claude stop. And uh, that is a uh, road scene, you see road scene, scene, but now we uh, installed three very nice place telescope. Uh, recently in this year, we published uh, uh, result of observation, well, not maybe successful because some gamma ray birds not give the optical, but 130 gamma ray birds, this is a reference. Uh, and uh, uh, you can see next one uh, graphic. This is uh, a common distribution of the number of GRB uh, along among the time after trigger, you see, this is the first minute, and you see here, that is the swift pointing, and you hear the master is the leader of the first minute observation of gamma ray birds. Of course, we observe usually in the polarizators, but the telescope not very big, 40 centimeters, and we can uh, we can detect the polarization only bright, maybe brighter than 14 or 15, 15 magnitude on the bright GLB. And uh, I discussed several results last year published in different journals. The first 
our analysis of the uh, optical, you see uh, we uh, collected the best light curve for gamma ray bursts from the early point of observation. You see the good light curves, the number of good light curves is very small. Here you see the best curve uh, is, uh, detected in all 30 years, no, 20 years observation of gamma ray bursts. There's only about 10 and half of them uh, master observation. You see, we pointed before, before optical appear, and we see the light curve as this afterglow, as is the thing, sometimes synchronously with gamma ray bursts. But you see the different light curve is the difference is light curve is about several orders. You see here, there's about 1,000 in, in the flux and, uh, and uh, several hundreds uh, between maximum in, uh, in time. At this time, between time after the trigger. And uh, you see, if we come new coordinates, this is the normalization time, not depending from redshift, as that is the uh, normalization to maximum optical curve of gamma ray bursts. You see, we discover is a special, uh, special type of the uh, smooth uh, optical cell similar emission. You see. Is that the shape of optical type is very similar in this coordinate. No redshift here, no, not depending from redshift, this feature. And I, I uh, usually people say a lot of light curve with very complicated, very complicated shape. But I remember the Auguste Rodin, the sculpture, he, he say, I, I think. Uh, a block of marble, 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 and cut off everything that is unnecessary. You see? And best, best uh, uh, light curve, you see here, and come to this new coordinates, you see, universal picture. Okay, because the real, real process is very, is very, complicated and uh, the most important process uh, can be uh, can be fall under the noise as uh, theoretical noise this theoretically uh, clean situation and predicted by very early nighting papers on uh, on the jet emission Ah, that is a very important gamma ray birth of uh, last uh, years, 19, uh, one year before. You see here, and a lot of paper published in Nature and in, uh, in, in, in very good journals. But I would like you say that the, the first time master. Uh, master from South Africa, South Africa first observed optical emission and uh, with the four polarizators. That's unique situation when the two telescopes from South Africa and Canary Island pointing to the one GRB. And we received several results now published. You see here in this in this astrophysics journal letters. And you see this gamma ray, this multi-message, real multi-message of astronomy. That is our optical observation, this gamma, this X-ray, and this three, three different, different spectral situations. But uh, unique result, our unique result, because we point very quickly, we detected polarization. You see this from paper, our paper with Mandel and his collaborators. You see our point, 8%, and after 2200 seconds, no polarization exists. 
no, two, four percent. That is very, very big uh, error. That is a, that is a fault. Uh, Liverpool telescope you know, after 200 seconds pointing to this, and we common, our common uh, uh, publication. You see, we receive the swift detected gamma ray bursts, and after that, we receive coordinates uh, uh, to two telescopes, 6,000 kilometers simultaneously come, and we have the four polarizator. Uh, four polarizators, and we have all stocks parameters of this camera. That is our, uh, you see, the, that is our non published light curve and polarization. You see polarization changing and come to the interstellar, the uh, Liverpool. As that is, you see four simultaneous uh, images of the gamma ray bursts in four polarization, unical, okay. Uh, next one, very interesting, uh, gamma ray burst. I now have no time, a lot of time, and I show you only interesting gamma ray burst. We discuss it uh, now, and uh, you see this uh, in previous talk discussed, and uh, uh, we detected that very nearest gamma ray bursts, very nearest, about uh, uh, 336 megaparsecs, you see. But nobody uh, uh, pointed that, I, I will say now, later. You see, this very interesting possibility. This is our light curve, you see. Very nice light curve. And uh, I would like to stress your attention that at this time uh, works uh, uh, one of the LIGO Virgo collaboration gravitational wave spectrometer. And usually, gravitational wave spectrometer can detect a gravitational wave from black hole, imagine black hole, of course, uh, the distance much more than the distance to this galaxy. So we have first limit for gravitational wave from gamma ray bird. The, the answer, no gravitational wave at this moment. You see here, that is a Ligo Virgo uh, state or in, at the GRB moment. And you see at this moment, Virgo and, and uh, Livingstone detector works. And we have the uh, upper limit of gravitational wave. First, in time, a real uh, upper limit of gravitational wave from the long GRB. The same, uh, you see here, the same, this, uh, uh, this, uh, this uh, well known. Okay. About theory, I now I, I want to discuss it very quickly the general point, my point, and maybe not only mine point on the problem of gamma ray bursts in the general picture. And we uh, come to the, with energy, we have no uh, problem to explain that this is a typical collapse uh, energy, uh, 10 to the 51, 53 of all the mass, one pair mass, solar mass, no problem. Uh, the Pachinsky, Bogdan Pachinsky, first we, point out this, the gamma ray bursts must be cosmological. So neutral, you see several, the Bogdan Kaczynski collapse of the massive star. You know this paper, okay. Energy, no problem. Spectrum, yes, yeah, more or less. Uh, the Yepik, the one where typical temperature in collapse in the neutron star surface, in the black hole surface, at the typical temperature, but I don't want to discuss it. Duration, this is uh, very simple. The long GRB uh, and short GRB from 101 to the 100, but more and more from the duration of the engine. The typical collapse times, Billion rust, not billion, million rust, less than the uh, observed time. So 
that is the main question. Why? One solution that uh, we have the collapse uh, in the time scale of the for magnet rotation collapse of the formation of black hole. This first magnet rotation collapse, this time the momentum of the amount and the moment of force. That is the formation of the disk-like object and diffusion. And maybe Ruffini and company developed the self going on this gamma ray forces. I uh, that is a time accretion to the from supernova envelope in binary system. So three scenarios we have for long GRB. Pussy scenario, first collapse of black hole. You see that very, very uh, quality picture. Formation black hole, formation massive accretion of this, and time of GRB is uh, equal to the time of diffusion, diffusion time, accretion time in this. Uh, spin art scenario. Uh, this um, I love, like this scenario and uh, proposed it, uh, a lot of years ago formation of object spin art and formation after uh, the first step, the formation spin art, and second step, formation of cat black hole. And the uh, Ruffini team uh, developed the model of formation. Uh, oh, yeah, I'm sorry, that is, uh, that is uh, uh, maybe some, uh, some mistake. Uh, 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 here, the, here, the uh, firstly, format, we have the binary system uh, with, uh, for example, neutron stars and the uh, Usual uh, massive stars which collapse, and you you know this in the first lecture on this uh, on our symposium. So spinar, spinar. What is a spinar? The my sentence next. First time during the magnet rotation collapse, if you have the big big angular moment, firstly. Collapse stopped by the centrifugal force. This idea is very old. I, do, I have no time for uh, this. See if you people could want to know the history. In uh, several years, <laughs> 10 to 13 years ago, we uh, described this model. You see, if you have the massive star very fast rotating and uh, collapsing, uh, I I think that the pyre collapse at very massive, 50, 90, 90 solar mass initial ones, 100 solar mass stars, and uh, very big, uh, very large angular moment uh, prevents the collapse. And we have the first shock that is a precursor when the spinar come to the as a quasi stationary state. After that, after that, uh, due to the magnetic, for example, field dissipation of angular moment, we have the some long time uh, gamma ray doors. And second, this, that is a gamma ray doors uh, uh, activity. Uh, uh, activity, uh, the activity of gamma ray doors uh, finished after the collapse of the central, central formation of the <coughs> limiting care black holes. We uh, proposed the quality models. And you see here, we see this uh, small. Oh, you have a five minutes left. You have okay. five minutes. Okay. That is very simple quality picture. Is that is the viscosity of the which uh, magnetic energy maybe maybe viscosity? Uh, that is the specific angular moment like to the artificial care parameter. If the care parameter, effective care parameter, less than unity, you have supernova. In another case, you have short, long. Uh, gamma ray doors with Plato and so on. 
you see the this model included all the relativistic effects, including the disappear, I'm sorry, disappear of the of the magnetic field and the uh, gravimagnetic forces, so to yeah, in care method, all included. You see the that is a plateau, and we have the very, very two order uh, fall of the luminosity, which we cannot understand in other mechanism. So, spinar is very critical from the some theoretical, but uh, last year appeared uh, three dimensional computer simulation, which shows the spinar is leaf. And uh, uh, now we simulated the different uh, precursor time and uh, the long uh, and the energy of the gamma ray bursts, and uh, people can be see. And uh, now we preparing new spin-up consideration, and we include the nano mechanism. And the uh, last of several minutes, I would like to say was very be very bright 16 years, four years ago. The two hour telescope detected, but unfortunately in polarization only this telescope in Canarian Islands. <coughs> you can see our observation. <laughs> we started before gamma ray bird uh, okay. This real upper limit that is optical synchronology with gamma, this moment of gamma ray trigger time, you see. And I would like to stress, you see the quasi-periodical, quasi-periodical sum, uh, not very significant, of course, but uh, we have the mathematical analysis and uh, this shows that we have the maybe some quasi-periodical sources, uh, process. <coughs> we use this, we use this, this observation as the uh, argument for the binary, for the, uh, for the uh, binary nature of the gamma ray bursts. We use it to model. That's very important because in spinar model, we need a lot of angular moment, which can be in very close binary system, contacted binary system, and uh, with period less than half a day. And in this situation, the, in binary system, these central stars uh, have the very, very far, uh, very, very big angular moment, not uh, uh, immediately formated the black hole and care parameter, mean care parameter more than unity. And uh, when the jet comes, we have the moving jet through this spiral function and produce such picture, which we observe. This first model, you see here, that is a typical, the observational is very good. And this real physical, the variation. Uh, maybe the, <coughs> another, <coughs> another model may be received from the Ruffini model uh, uh, after several days. Maybe we discuss it with Remo how to we can include it uh, in our paper discussion about the model of Ruffini. In any case, in binary system, we, we have non homogeneous. Uh, stellar winds before before collapse of the more massive company. This model A, you see the very close binary system produces the sun. That's very simple model. Gravitational wave, uh, gravitational forces is distorted of the uh, stellar wind and jet moving with very high velocity and produce variation on the scales, several dozen seconds. You see, several dozen seconds because stellar wind's velocity is much smaller than the, uh, than the jet velocity. 
the model for stellar wind that we simulated such behavior and problem of the first model. This model uh, that the ring uh, orbital uh, in the equator, but that may be produced perpendicular. And so we put, uh, consider another model when the second component moves on the elliptical ob object, and so the distorted the periodical stellar wind or uh, or uh, ejected the shells. And the jets, you see here, result of calculation, the model B, not very, not very fast. You see here that as a relative density of stellar wind, you see period, quasi periodical, not periodical, because the stellar wind velocity is changing. You see here longer, longer, longer. Uh, this is a radius uh, in solar radius, and divided to the you can divide it to the uh, speed of light. Which you see that the hundred second, not more. And uh, we we have the some uh, approximation of the process for these parameters. And conclusion we we. Uh, considered the model of maybe this is uh, one of the first, one of the first, not not uh, not strong, but maybe first manifestation of binarity of the gamma ray doors, of the gamma ray doors. Uh, mm, no, uh, the people can become to my appendix. You see very nice. 11 optical transient firstly discovered by master in this year. Very nice. Uh, if the people want the light curve and the common paper, uh, welcome to us because now we publish it only the gamma center network telegrams. This is how young people in our laboratory. Thank you very much for attention. I am finished. Thank you very much for this nice presentation. <clears throat> we have a time for a very short question. Is there any question? I don't see that anyone typed in the chat any question. Moreover, we are running out of the time. So I thank you again once more for this nice presentation. And now we move to the next speaker is uh, Joanna Tiriluk, uh, High Energy Neutrinos Latest Result from iScoop. Please start to share your screen and start the presentation. I don't see if Joanna is online. Oh, yes. I cannot hear your voice. I don't know if your microphone is muted. Okay, now I see the camera. Okay, so now it's my full presentation. Yes. We see it. Please, please start. Okay. Okay. So I'd like to thank for the invitation. It's been a great pleasure to uh, present the latest result from uh, IceCube. Uh, neutrino astronomy has started with the discovery of neutrinos from the uh, supernova 1987. Uh, 25 years later, IceCube uh, reported the discovery of uh, extragalactic PV neutrinos of uh, extra uh, galactic origin. And a few years ago, uh, uh, the neutrinos, high energy neutrinos were found to, to be pointing to uh, a blazer, which was in coincidence with, um, uh, uh, with photons, gamma rays, uh, 
the place that was in a thriving uh, state. So with neutrinos, uh, one of the goal in addition to modern messenger astronomy and looking for coincidences with uh, uh, traditional uh, optical uh, messengers and also gravitational waves, uh, we would like to expand the observational universe towards uh, higher energies uh, and larger distances. So this region here marked as black uh, indicates the, the part of the sky that's uh, opaque to photons, and this is because high energy photons interact with uh, uh, EBL or cosmic microwave uh, background, and basically they are not uh, visible. So, Ice Cube uh, experiment is, uh, uh, is the only one cubic kilometer uh, experiment. Um, uh, that has so far detected uh, uh, these uh, PV neutrinos. It's, um, it's instrumented with uh, 5,000 optical modules. It spans one cubic kilometer. Uh, the distance between the strings and optical modules deploys on this, uh, deployed on the strings uh, uh, were conservatively chosen to <clears throat> Uh, and optimize for the optical prop properties of uh, the eyes, such as absorption and scattering uh, uh, lines. In addition to uh, ice cube array, which is buried deeply in the ice, so you can see the deep core that is a smaller array that, uh, uh, that was uh, built in uh, with a uh, smaller optical module spacing. Uh, primarily uh, aim to uh, uh, pursue oscill oscillation physics with uh, uh, atmospheric neutrinos. Uh, with IceCube, uh, uh, we cannot detect or reconstruct uh, individual flavors of neutrinos, uh, and we're not sensitive to neutrinos and bantai neutrinos, with one exception that's called partial resonance. Uh, instead, we uh, observe uh, a few event topologies. One is called uh, track. Uh, tracks are produced, uh, muon tracks are produced in charge current interactions of muon neutrinos in the ice. Uh, and optical modules detect uh, the Cherenkov radiation uh, uh, from the muon propagating through the ice. Uh, the advantage of tracks is uh, superior uh, pointing resolution, so they are primarily used for searching uh, point sources. The energy resolution, because we're only observing part of the, ta uh, of the track in the detector, is, uh, uh, is relative, uh, is worse compared to the other signature, which is called cascade. So cascades are produced in uh, uh, interaction of the electron, uh, deep elastic uh, interaction of the electron uh, with nucleons, as well as low energy uh, tau neutrinos. And we can also detect uh, products of off-label neutrino interactions by a neutral current. Uh, what we call a composite is a double cascade. It's produced in, uh, uh, for example, uh, tau hadronic decays uh, uh, or starting track, which is a signature of muon neutrino, uh, which is uh, which originates in in the detector. Uh, ice cube. The main background is in atmospheric uh, muons. Uh, the second uh, uh, background for astrophysical searches is atmospheric uh, neutrinos. Uh, but there are also signals for uh, physics with uh, unique physics with astrophysical uh, atmospheric neutrinos. Atmospheric neutrinos, high energy atmospheric neutrinos um, uh, are of high energy. They are inaccessible in current accelerators. And so we can do physics uh, at high energies. Typically, neutrino rates uh, for neutrino telescopes are uh, calculated uh, 
uh, there is a straightforward uh, relation between the flux and the factor called effective, uh, effective area. The effective area takes into account the size of the detector, uh, the probability of interaction, and the Earth uh, absorptions. Uh, so with uh, atmospheric neutrinos, they travel through the Earth. Uh, we can't really distinguish muon neutrinos uh, coming from the south because they, there is an overwhelming background of uh, muons from cosmic rays. Uh, and the Earth absorption starting at uh, roughly 40 TV uh, starts uh, uh, absorbing these, uh, these neutrinos. Uh, so at highest energies, we can only see horizontal neutrinos. This is uh, reflected in the plot in the bottom right. So you see the effective area as a function of, uh, of energy. Uh, and there is a strong dependence on the angular uh, direction, whether the neutrinos are coming through uh, the Earth in a vertical or coming from a, a horizontal direction. So those which are verticals are being absorbed, uh, absorbed by, by the Earth. Uh, with high energy uh, atmospheric neutrinos, uh, uh, this is an important probe to call to QCB uh, physics. It's sensitive to hadronic interactions. So we're interested in describing modeling fluxes of atmospheric uh, neutrinos. Uh, hadronic interactions are important uh, in cosmic rays. Uh, we have interaction of cosmic rays with the air that's fixed target. Uh, the information about modeling these hadronic interactions and predictions on neutrino flux uh, or some other experiments uh, like PA, so proton iron, PP. Uh, and uh, all of these uh, mesons that produce uh, conventional and uh, so-called prompt neutrinos, uh, uh, they are producing the former forward regions. So it's, uh, it's basically non perturbative uh, uh, QCD. Uh, the, the experimental data that's relevant for uh, modeling uh, Neutrino fluxes, atmospheric neutrino fluxes are those from LHC, uh, REC, future fixed target experiments, uh, past HERA B, the future EAC. Uh, in addition to hadronic physics, uh, these uh, atmospheric neutrinos are uh, important for astrophysical neutrino searches and at lower, lower energy uh, values for oscillation physics. Uh, a summary of low energy and high energy measurements of the atmospheric flux is shown uh, on this plot. The dashed line uh, roughly separates the low and high energy regime. So for this talk, uh, the relevant part is uh, on the right. Uh, number three, this indicates TV, so above uh, uh, TV energy were basically uh, uh, the experiments that are uh, that are performing uh, the flux measurements are uh, Antares, primarily Ice Cube, and there are some uh, measurements by uh, observatories like uh, Super K. But because of the their detector is smaller than uh, the flux uh, the falls and there's the uh, less sensitivity. Uh, the atmospheric uh, conventional fluxes are pretty well measure, uh, measured. There's an uncertainty from hadronic interactions uh, that could be reduced in uh, uh, future uh, high energy nuclear physics experiments. Uh, no prompt component has been observed uh, yet. Uh, and it's uh, it's important uh, for the astrophysical searches. Now, the atmospheric uh, atmospheric neutrinos, uh, especially muon neutrinos, are uh, important background for uh, point source searches. Uh, the first evidence of uh, of the source uh, came from the alert of Ice Cube uh, detecting. 300 neutrino events, and there was a multi-messenger uh, 
uh, multi-wavelength follow-up conservation of uh, this event. Uh, the blazer appeared to be in a flaring state, uh, but a single event does not uh, make uh, a high significant measurement or, or spatial correlation. So what I still did, uh, we served archival uh, data for uh, neutrino clusters from earlier data collected by IceCube. Uh, so this is done by a standard point source, uh, point source search. Uh, for this particular uh, source, we used uh, the location of the source uh, and uh, we searched for uh, an access of, uh, of the neutrino uh, signal above the background. So for this search, the background are atmospheric neutrinos. Uh, and we found uh, a cluster of uh, lower energy neutrinos than the alert, which was initially uh, uh, triggered the search. So the alert is, uh, is indicated on the uh, right uh, edge of the, of the first plot. Uh, around 2014-15, we saw the cluster of uh, of events, the lower energy events, uh, but they counted for uh, 3.5 sig uh, sigma uh, significance. Uh, so since that alert, uh, there were multiple uh, follow-up searches. So this is uh, in response to alerts issued by. Uh, by ice cubes, so we issue alerts on high energy neutrinos uh, with different uh, event topologies, so cascades or starting events that I'll describe uh, in a bit uh, later. Uh, and that triggers, depending on the significance um, uh, and the energy, the multi messenger follow up that we've heard in the previous uh, talk. Uh, in addition to trigger events, I still searches for uh, sources in the full scale that's, that's all without any information from, from the catalog, gamma rays, and other, uh, and other uh, observatories. Uh, so this is typically done by the uh, likelihood method. So we divide the whole sky in in pixels and for each direction we use information about the data uh, and model the uh, position of the source in that particular pixel uh, the position uh, we have uh, pdfs that describe uh, source characteristics the background char uh, characteristics uh, and we form a test statistics uh, where in the denominator we have the likelihood uh, uh, constructed depending that there is a source contribution, flux from a source, and in the denominator uh, we have an assumption that uh, all events are come from, from the background. So based on this, um, uh, on the search, we found uh, the hottest spot, the spot uh, that was in coincidence with, uh, uh, with the Galaxy and DC 1068. I should also point out that all these uh, test statistics, we also, uh, we also have uh, trial factors. So the background is, uh, uh, is randomized uh, and we search for co uh, coincidental uh, or artificial correlation, chance cor correlations, uh, uh, just because uh, we don't have uh, enough sensitivity to, uh, to the signal. So the final uh, significance is called post-trial uh, probability, uh, and that takes into account uh, the search uh, uh, over when we randomize uh, all the experimental neutrino events, and as I said, they're dominated by atmospheric neutrinos, uh, and then find uh, uh, how many of these uh, random maps uh, provide a significance uh, 
longer than uh, than the data, which was found uh, uh, in, in the real search. So the significance is not very uh, significant, 9.5% uh, of trial. In order to increase sensitivity, we usually uh, search for uh, point sources with uh, uh, with a predefined list. So this is to increase uh, uh, or increase sensitivity due to these uh, trial factors and looking uh, at the same uh, price uh, multiple times. Uh, what is shown here, you see. Uh, the upper limits, since we didn't find any significant, uh, uh, significantly significant uh, uh, correlation with the source. The most significant ones are the four sources. Uh, these are the four uh, triangles uh, uh, for the declination, sign declination zero. The second one corresponds uh, out on the, on the blue curve. The second one is uh, a TXX blazer and there are two other blazers. So these are the most significant uh, sources. For a given assumption on what these are the physical neutrinos uh, spectrum they should follow, uh, we have a different group of uh, uh, results. The, the black ones correspond to uh, the assumption that the uh, uh, flux of astrophysical neutrino is soft and follows uh, e to the minus three. And the red one is uh, when the assumption is that astrophysical neutrinos follow e to the minus uh, two spectrum. We also have uh, uh, sensitivity lines for Antares, which is located at the uh, northern hemisphere, so it's more sensitive to uh, sources which are located in the south. Uh, in this case, uh, you can see lower sensitivity uh, uh, for ice cube in the southern sky just because the atmospheric neutrinos, uh, uh, neutrinos in general, are for this particular itself more, more significant for the northern sky. Also, from all sky source cascades, uh, cascades. So, cascades can be attracted in uh, full sky, so it's not limited. Sorry, you have five minutes left. You have five minutes. Uh, and we have not uh, seen this different uh, uh, source. Other, uh, Another search was with uh, uh, gravitational waves. Uh, the search was performed with 11 gravitational waves uh, events in total. Uh, so for this, we use the gamma ray follow-up uh, 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 stream from Ice Cube. So what you can see for this particular gravitational uh, uh, event, you, you have Brook crosses. So these are the neutrino events that are uh, that were uh, found in Ice Cube around uh, like 15 minutes from uh, from the event. Uh, no significant access was found, and we were able to uh, derive uh, a limit, so a limit on isotropic equivalent uh, energy, which was emitted by. Uh, uh, the mergers of black holes and neutron stars, uh, they are marked in triangle. So the orange one is for a neutron star and the blue ones are for, uh, for black hole mergers. We search for correlation with neutrinos with ultra high energy cosmic waves, the highest energy waves do propagate in straight lines. Uh, but we didn't find any correlation. Uh, the second part of my talk is about the measurement that uh, we were able to uh, make following this.
excuse me, Joanna, if you don't mind, could you please disactivate your webcam? Because we cannot hear you now. There is a problem yes, with cannot, the yeah. connection speed, apparently. Seems we lost the connection. Joanna, can you hear us? You are unmuted. We cannot hear you. Apparently, there is a connection loss. Yes, because I, I see her camera on, but I don't, I cannot hear her voice. Okay, maybe we we can go on with the program. Uh, okay. Or... Okay, she's back. Uh, Joanna, are you back? I'm sorry. Yeah, we couldn't hear you. Now we can. Yes, you are here. Yes. Yes. So okay. shall I go back? I don't know when you lost me. So, so, sorry. Can you please repeat? Uh, shall I continue with this slide, or shall I move back? Yeah, it was like a, not too long that we lost the connection. Maybe you could continue from here. Okay. Uh, so one uh, one analysis type is is called high energy starting events. This was uh, the this was the the analysis that uh, uh, that led to uh, a claim of discovery of astrophysical neutrinos. Uh, this analysis is sensitive to high energy uh, uh, neutrinos above 60 uh, TeV. Uh, another analysis is cascade analysis. This analysis is sensitive to uh, neutrinos that are uh, with significantly lower energy threshold. Uh, so all the systematics due to energy scale are, uh, are reduced compared to the previous one. The summary of all the fused measurements is, uh, is presented in, in this plot. Uh, so I just want you to focus on three lines. The green one is the high energy starting events. The, the red one is for, for cascades and the blue one is, uh, is for tracks. So they have relatively large uh, errors. Some analysis have lower errors, uh, lower uh, uncertainties. This all includes all systematics, uh, but they're consistent. Uh, what you see on this plot is uh, the cascades is uh, shown, flux is shown as the purple band in the middle, uh, tracks flux is shown as the blue one. Uh, what this plot illustrates is the connection of uh, uh, energies emitted in uh, uh, in gamma ray background and in cosmic uh, cosmic rays. So the fluxes are uh, similar. Uh, uh, there are different modeling uh, models. So here I mentioned just. Uh, just two that set upper limits on the total flux on neutrinos. If we were, uh, if neutrinos were originating from the same source as uh, uh, as gamma rays and uh, high energy uh, cosmic rays, what you see here that the part of the uh, purple one sticks about the limits set up um, by this multi messenger connection. Uh, so the Origin of these neutrinos is uh, is a puzzle. Uh, we claim that uh, this was proposed by some theoretical model and estimated before, but now we're confirming that these sources are perhaps uh, opaque to gamma rays and are not visible in uh, uh, by the telescopes. Uh, this plot shows that expected uh, galactic. Uh, a component to the total flux is is low, so below twenty percent. Uh, we could also uh, expand the diffuse analysis to search for a flat flavor composition, since all the analysis before assumed uh, the same uh, uh, the same fraction of neutrino, muon, and tau uh, and taus. Uh, 
that we are we are not sensitive uh, to distinguish uh, models between uh, uh, like different new physics in, in the oscillation uh, sectors. So the results are uh, right now are compatible with uh, with the assumption that the production is uh, uh, it just comes from the pion decay uh, to muons and muon decay into to electron. So this results in one to one to one flavor composition at Earth. And the last topic is uh, uh, fr from the particle physics. It's neutrino nucleon cross section. So this is basically, uh, well, it's related to how we detect neutrinos. So the neutrinos that go through the Earth are being absorbed. Uh, the probability of the absorption depends on the cross section. Uh, what, what you see on this plot is the angle distribution correlated with the neutrino uh, energy and the transmission pro uh, probability is marked in, uh, in colors. So the high energy neutrinos uh, uh, and vertical are, uh, are basically absorbed by, by the Earth. When the first measurement uh, in energies of neutrinos far above the accelerator data uh, was performed by, uh, by IceCube with muon neutrinos. Uh, we were able to uh, check the scaling factor, uh, how the cross-section will scale compared to the standard uh, uh, model cross-section with, uh, with the parton distribution functions that are marked uh, that are taken from the reference uh, at the bottom. And there were two other analyses, three other analyses uh, that expanded the search and used different, slightly different techniques uh, to get the energy dependence uh, uh, of the cross sections. So instead of just scaling this uh, in a wide energy range, now we have the beams uh, of the cross section in the beams of uh, energies. So the change of, uh, of the cross-section is expected. Uh, ice cube will be limited to the, in energy, so the ultra-high energy will not be accessible uh, by the current methods because the, the method presented on, on the left-hand side, uh, because it's basically limited to neutrinos that would be uh, uh, downgoing since the ultra high energy uh, neutrinos are will, will not will be disappeared and will, will interact in uh, in Earth due to increased uh, cross sections. So there are other uh, effects uh, uh, that uh, may increase or decrease the cross section. It's important because uh, by measuring the total number of events, we are sensitive to the flux which. It's largely unknown and the cross section. So if you want to see for a fact so that the, in, in QCD and possibly being standard model, uh, that we should be able to disentangle these, uh, these events. And the last uh, slide is on upgrades. So what's uh, in the future, uh, we're planning to uh, instrument the detector with uh, uh, seven additional string. The deployment is planned for uh, the 22 23 season in Antarctica. Uh, here, uh, so the new uh, addition would be new hardware. So we would be testing uh, uh, new optical sensors. So, for example, MDOM will consist uh, with multiple optical. Uh, uh, multiple PMTs of smaller size than the traditional uh, ice cube uh, dump. Uh, the egg will consist of uh, larger PMTs, uh, two larger PMTs. Uh, the effect, uh, the area uh, would be increased, and we want to uh, have a higher acceptance for the light coming from. Uh, both sides, so above and, uh, and and below, since the ice cube uh, typical dome just has P and P pointing uh, downwards. Uh, there will also be calibration devices, new calibration devices. So, so all of this is uh, uh, aims to uh, reduce, uh, recalibrate also existing uh, data in order to reduce systematic uncertainties. 
I'd like to conclude with uh, uh, the future. So there is a proposal uh, for the next generation ice cube that would also that would include uh, uh, additions su such as uh, radio detectors, beta surface detectors, and you can see uh, a plot here which shows one example of how the sensitivity to, for example, a flare, flare from uh, TXS, uh, how the discovery uh, threshold or the significance would increase with the larger detector volume. So that's all. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for this beautiful, nice presentation. Uh, unfortunately, we are really, I'm, it's 20 minutes late of the time, so we don't have time for the questions. And we directly move to the next speaker. So anyone who has the question could write in the chat and the speakers could see in the chat and answer the questions. So please, the next, the last speaker of the session is uh, Maxim Klopov. Please uh, start to share your screen and start the presentation. Let me do it, uh, please. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you. Uh, I thank very much uh, everybody uh, for a uh, possibility to discuss. Uh, well, do you see my screen? Let's hope yes. Yes, yes, yes. yes we see your okay. screen. <laughs> okay. And do you see the full uh, uh, presentation? Yes, uh, full slide. Yes, full sl slide. Yes. Okay. So uh, we discussed uh, uh, just in the previous talk uh, multi-messenger astronomy. And uh, in cosmology, uh, we may have also similar thing as uh, uh, multi-messenger uh, cos uh, cosmology of new physics, which inevitably appears in uh, uh, the uh, current uh, uh, cosmological paradigm of inflationary models with biosynthesis and dark matter energy. And reminding the legacy of Zildovich, I'd like to say that it is, uh, 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 he was not only the person who personally uh, triggered a lot of uh, uh, di directions of development uh, in these fields, but also his analysis of links between cosmology and particle physics uh, revealed many additional model dependent elements which uh, provide uh, some refined test of the physics underlying inflation virus synthesis and dark matter from uh, uh, cosmological viewpoint in particle physics we are interested in most fundamental properties like uh, conservation laws related with symmetries, which provide us stability of particles, which we consider as candidates for dark matter. Uh, the uh, high temperature behavior of field theory gives us prediction of phase transition in early universe, and uh, the transition can uh, give us uh, uh, some topological defects and uh, macroscopic uh, structures. And uh, uh, also, there is a possibility to probe uh, uh, some uh, stages of early universe, which uh, just finished very early, so we don't have direct information about them, but there is indirect possibility probing them by black holes, primordial black holes. So actually, cosmological uh, dark matter uh, just assumes existence of something what is non-baryonic, and uh, uh, have some specific, uh, sufficiently weak interaction. The simplest case is to consider, uh, so dark matter in that sense is cosmological reflection of the structure or fundamental structure of micro world, it's uh, fundamental symmetry, because extension of symmetry of uh, a standard model gives us a new conservation law and candidates which uh, lightest particles which possess this uh, new uh, charges, uh, they uh, are stable or, or long-living, and uh, uh, this conservation law prohibits them to decay, and so that they play the role of dark matter. Uh, the, uh, uh, all the existing examples just uh, uh, demonstrated, because we have uh, our parity in supersymmetry, 
uh, we have uh, 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 we have uh, a majority in Mira uh, world. We have uh, PC Queen Symmetry in Axion models, and uh, uh, we uh, uh, consider. Uh, some macros can also consider some macroscopic uh, forms of uh, dark uh, uh, of uh, um, uh, new forms uh, of matter of non-relativistic matter in our universe. The simplest uh, possibility was the miracle because uh, the um, so I see that there is some delay of slide relative to what I am talking. So we have to. I think wait a bit with my slide to show that it is uh, 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 just uh, uh, corresponding to what I'm saying. So actually, uh, if we take uh, frozen out uh, um, particles of some uh, created uh, being in equilibrium in early universe, uh, then, then if they are weakly interacting uh, and massive, then at masses about 100 uh, uh, GV, uh, they... Uh, can fit the observational uh, data about the dark matter density. And uh, uh, it, uh, uh, however, a uh, direct uh, search of such WIMPs uh, gives uncontroversial results, as well as there is no supersymmetric particles at the LHC. Well, LHC was motivated that something, some new physics should appear in uh, uh, the uh, a range of 100 or you know, up to 1 TeV, uh, just uh, in order to uh, relate it with the uh, nature of electric symmetry breaking, uh, uh, with uh, uh, solutions of uh, problem of Higgs boson mass uh, divergence. Uh, so uh, it uh, uh, shows that we should go to much wider class of uh, uh, the um, uh, dogmatic candidates, and they may be sterile neutrinos, it may be axions, which are necessary in uh, uh, solution of strong CP violation in QCD. Uh, it may be gravitinos, uh, even if supersymmetry is not uh, uh, broken at the uh, 100 GV TV scale, it may be broken at Planckian scale, but when it is un unification of all the uh, four fundamental forces, and then we may have nice super uh, gravity, Stravinsky super gravity, uh, but uh, such inflationary scenario, which can provide super heavy gravity in the dark matter, just uh, loses importance of super symmetry as a solution for the original electric symmetry breaking scale or uh, the uh, finite uh, value of Higgs boson mass. Uh, and then we can address some other solutions which can uh, give us very non-trivial candidates uh, like uh, uh, multiple charged particles. Uh, today, Timur uh, Bigbaev discussed uh, some specific, specific type of these particles which uh, are um, multi uh, minus charge, minus two charged uh, uh, lepton-like particles bound with primordial helium. And so it is something that uh, uh, just involves only one parameter mass of uh, this uh, hypothetical particle, but it gives us uh, the uh, possibility uh, to uh, just uh, descri describe all that because uh, this helium shell of this atom is uh, something that uh, is uh, uh, only... Uh, 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 related to known physics of nuclear interaction, atomic uh, physics, but the conditions in which all that uh, these uh, known laws are applied are so non-trivial that it really needs a uh, lot of studies to understand what really happens when this uh, uh, dark atom comes uh, to underground adapters. Uh, well, maybe supermassive particles, neural shadow particles, and they. Uh, follow from different motivations of the extension for standard model. And so one can expect that we may, uh, they can coexist in multi-component dark matter. Uh, so actually what we may see uh, treat is that we may have some sources in, of, in very early universe which accompany uh, physics of inflation, barrier synthesis, and dark matter 
which are created in the early universe. And uh, together with these uh, necessary elements, with a necessary model dependent by products of the responding uh, solution, just uh, gives us what I call multi-message cosmology. And uh, its predictions should confront the observations uh, by multi-messenger astronomy. Uh, so here, here, just I give some uh, idea what happens if we have uh, stable particles uh, or uh, unsta uh, unstable particles. And if your particles are unstable but sufficiently long living, uh, then their decays are a uh, source of non-equilibrium particles in uh, equilibrium of uh, uh, cosmological plasma of the first second of uh, expansion, uh, we have some energetic particles which uh, evidently can uh, change uh, processes uh, uh, in this period, uh, just in and was influencing the spectrum of CMB background or CMB or uh, just cause uh, uh, some changes in uh, primordial uh, in chemical uh, abundance. Uh, if they decay just now, they are sources of uh, uh, high energy cosmic rays, for example, or high energy gamma radiation. Uh, uh, so, uh, actually, uh, one of the possibilities to go to much smaller uh, uh, time scales uh, to uh, the very early universe before one second is to. Uh, consider primordial black holes and uh, go just uh, discuss today, uh, reminding mechanism of Zildovich Novikov that you may stop expansion in uh, within cosmological horizon. That gives you um, a primordial black holes of uh, uh, strongly sub-solar uh, uh, sub, uh, solar substellar mass because uh, the mass within horizon was very small there. Uh, and uh, it corresponds to strong and homogeneity. But if this particle, uh, this dark matter, uh, dark, uh, with, uh, if these uh, primordial black holes have masses uh, above uh, 10 to 15 uh, uh, gram, uh, you uh, uh, have uh, them as the component of dark matter. And there are severe constraints on uh, uh, such form of dark matter. However, such constraints may be uh, reconsidered, taken into account the possibility that man may be primordial black hole cluster. Primordial black holes are proofs for different uh, uh, catastrophic processes in a very early universe. Uh, for example, uh, post inflational uh, dust like stage gives us a uh, uh, possibility to. Uh, suppress, uh, to remove the exponential suppression of the probability of black hole formation. Uh, but uh, it turns out, as we uh, have shown with uh, Sasha Polarov, that uh, this uh, uh, suppre uh, suppression still, uh, we remove exponential suppression, but we have uh, power law suppression, which is sufficiently uh, strong. Uh, however, it gives us minimal uh, uh, probability to form primordial black holes uh, at the stages of dominance of super heavy particles. Uh, uh, if there are some super heavy um, uh, metastable particles, they can dominate in the universe. At this period, you have formation of objects uh, uh, of correspondingly small mass, but this object just uh, uh, possess all the property of uh, development of gravitational instability in this period, and uh, uh, there may be uh, primordial black holes formed at this stage. Uh, there may be first order phase transition, which also can uh, give us uh, information uh, about the Mm, uh, phase transition, because if you have uh, first order phase transition, you have true vacuum uh, bubbles, so they expand, and uh, the uh, bubble walls, uh, when they intersect, they can form false, bag, uh, false vacuum uh, bag, which uh, just is uh, uh, false uh, vacuum, uh, with, uh, ma uh, contains false vacuum with negative pressure, so it, is, uh, it forms a uh, black hole. Uh, primordial black hole evaporation is uh, something what uh, can give us information about black hole creation, even if they were not uh, created, uh, if we do not survive to present time. Uh, and uh, it gives us uh, uh, some new sources of uh, uh, 
um, energetic particles uh, in the period of uh, um, uh, uh, in the period of the evaporation. Uh, it's very important to notice that together with uh, 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 particles uh, for ordinary uh, matter, uh, they produce everything what exists in our space-time. And in that sense, it's universal source, uh, which may provide us the possibility to create uh, super uh, weakly interacting uh, part uh, particles uh, in the result of evaporation. Uh, Actually, uh, we got used to the idea that we live in homogeneous and isotropic world. But does it uh, exclude the possibility of strong primordial non-homogeneities? Actually, no. If this component corresponding to this non-homogeneous distribution is uh, very tiny and uh, uh, strongly subdominant, then average effect of such a strong non-homogeneity is rather weak and uh, fits uh, the estimation of the uh, uh, fluctuations of uh, uh, density, which are uh, reflected in CMB uh, fluctuations. Uh, uh, the uh, possibility of, of such strong and homogeneity can be of two types. There may be phase transition that gives us uh, some uh, unstable cosmological defects. Uh, another possibility is uh, that uh, there is a uh, strong and homogeneity in distribution of uh, baryon excess created in various interests. And in its cream form, it gives us antimatter domains in baryon isometric universe. Uh, in cosmological phase transition, we either have uh, such transitions at high temperature, or we have uh, such uh, uh, transitions uh, uh, in uh, uh, at the inflation of the station, then interaction of the heat field with uh, instanton gives us uh, corresponding phase transition. And remind us, we uh, can uh, remind his uh, uh, solution of uh, the main rules uh, in his work with Zeldovich, uh, with Kobzarif and Open. Uh, his idea about uh, mm, the uh, continue, uh, in the case of continuous degeneracy, uh, you have uh, cosmic streams, and uh, we discussed with him the uh, possibility of isolated singular points, and uh, these isolated uh, points in grand unified theory, these uh, uh, defects are magnetic monopoles with uh, the corresponding problem. Uh, a simple U1 model uh, just gives us the idea. It is the model which uh, uh, corresponds to the physics of axion-like models. So axion, when you have two, two scales, one of which is rather high, and another one just uh, uh, much smaller. And uh, uh, if we have this phase transition uh, at the uh, stage of um, the phase transition, uh, after reheating, uh, then we have uh, uh, in such model uh, first formation of cosmic strains, and then after the second phase transition takes place, which uh, just uh, gives mass to this phase, then it uh, becomes uh, uh, some uh, uh, oscillating around uh, true vacuum uh, field, uh, which uh, uh, possess uh, properties uh, which. Uh, and give us uh, large-scale correlations, which we call r uh, which uh, uh, just are strong correlations, which uh, gives us uh, uh, the possibility to put constraints on action that matter. Uh, uh, Alexander Dolgov today has uh, discussed uh, the uh, Dolgov-Silk model, uh, which is just... Uh, uh, gives the possibility to explain how massive primordial black holes may appear. Uh, in case of axion-like uh, scenario, uh, you can have it uh, if your first phase transition takes place uh, uh, at the uh, inflationary stage, and then second phase transition just uh, uh, comes. It gives you uh, some regions where you have... Uh, 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 another vacuum, and correspondingly, you have closed walls. A uh, collapse of these closed walls uh, gives you uh, the uh, possibility of creation uh, of uh, uh, massive black holes, and their mass is determined by uh, two uh, principal uh, constraints. One of them is that the uh, width of the wall uh, should not uh, uh, be larger than the uh, 
Schwarz Hitler radios, of course, pointing mass, so that uh, you can fit all the uh, wall inside uh, gravitational radius. It gives you minimal estimation, and maximum estimation comes from the coin. But if you have too uh, uh, large a wall, then <coughs> you have a um, possibility to uh, uh, dominate before this wall appears as a whole. So pieces of wool can dominate, and this uh, region uh, becomes uh, super luminally expanding because the uh, wool dominated uh, uh, universe uh, just uh, has a mass scale factor, which is uh, square of time, so it will never uh, reach uh, this uh, uh, object. So it gives you a uh, principal and maximal uh, pro probability. And uh, it leads to a uh, specific uh, uh, closed wall collapse, which gives us uh, the uh, uh, estimation for the primordial gravitational wave uh, uh, background, uh, which may be of interest for not only Lisa Virgo, but also for future Lisa uh, uh, experiments. Now we have a gravitational wave transient catalog, which uh, just uh, uh, gives us interesting possibilities that uh, there is a um, gives us the interesting possibility that there is a, mm, uh, some uh, 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 amount of events which were rather close in time one to another and it's an interesting feature because in this scenario we have a, a, a correlation so that you don't have single uh, bla uh, black hole. Uh, and they are not produced randomly, but you have a cloud of primordial black holes, so that in this cluster you have, a, a, first of all, a high probability to form binaries, and uh, uh, in the other okay, and uh, the other point is that we have such a cloud which may have contained sufficiently massive black holes, and the recent results just uh, show that there appear events in which. Uh, which can be highly explained by the uh, um, evolution of uh, supermassive uh, stars. Uh, so actually, uh, today, Anastasia Kirichenko just discussed uh, the possibilities to probe uh, uh, existence of uh, strong and homogeneity in baryon excess, uh, so that you have anti-baryon excess, and anti-baryon excess uh, just uh, uh, if uh, it is in sufficiently large uh, region, this sufficiently large region is determined by diffusion of uh, barons and antibarons to the border of this domain. And in this uh, diffusion, uh, we have uh, uh, annihilation so that small domains do not survive in the matter surrounding. However, if it is sufficiently large, and in terms of mass, it is about 1,000 solar masses, then such object can exist, and uh, uh, something uh, reminding uh, what discussed, uh, in, is discussed in Dolgov's uh, silk scenario is that if you have spontaneous baryosynthesis, then you may have uh, uh, average density, which is uh, corresponds to uh, bar uh, baryon charge, which is positive, but you may have some regions in which you have uh, excess of antibaryons. And uh, uh, it uh, predicts the existence of uh, uh, the uh, antimatter stars uh, in our galaxy. And uh, uh, today, Anastasia Kirichenko discussed the possibility how we can probe it. Just it's an interesting story. You have some uh, single source which gives you some uh, mm, uh, uh, some uh, uh, background effect. So if you talk about uh, anti-nuclei, uh, then they are moving. So first of all, antimatter should an uh, can uh, annihilate, and it gives us contribution to gamma background. Uh, and uh, uh, another point is that it uh, can produce uh, uh, anti-helium or heavier nuclei, and uh, they can be uh, just uh, can reach uh, Earth and uh, should be detected in underground uh, in the uh, cosmic detectors. Uh, Amela, discussed today by Andrei Mayorum, just started to uh, look for them. And first signal from antimatter uh, has been announced uh, in 2016 by <coughs> principal investigator of IMS2, uh, Professor Samuel Ting. Uh, and uh, it was anti-helium-free, 
and uh, uh, two years later, so now he uh, cl uh, claimed uh, eight clear single track events with uh, the uh, charge minus two uh, and in uh, helium mass range. Uh, and uh, uh, also they have something what looks like anti helium four. However, uh, the probability for uh, this event uh, uh, is uh, still not sufficient to exclude it as uh, uh, it is background uh, uh, event. So uh, we should wait uh, uh, some years when statistics will be significant to say something definite at above five standard deviation level. Uh, so, just to conclude, let me say that we, uh, modern cosmology involves new physics, uh, different dogmatic candidates from different, uh, um, uh, come from different motivations of the extension of the standard model and co can coexist in multi component dark matter. New stable and metastable particles, topological defects, primordial black holes provide proofs for physics of the real universe. Strong primordial nonlinear structures uh, maybe uh, just uh, can explain what we see in gravitational wave detectors. And uh, 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 these uh, proofs of new physics reflect the basic idea of cosmoparticle physics, developing legacy of Zildovich and Sakharov and studies on fundamental relationship of cosmology and particle physics. The basic idea is that if you have new physical scale, uh, this scale can be approached from below by uh, experimental particle physics. It gives strong cosmological effect when it is uh, around Planck scale and uh, smaller, but in the mid, mid uh, uh, at the uh, mediate scales, uh, you have uh, um, uh, possibility of uh, astrophysical proofs for this new physics. Uh, and I'd like to finish uh, just uh, noticing that Reminder is a Deutsch who also can. Uh, Remind Andrei Dmitry Sakharov. Next year, United Nations announced uh, yes, Sakharov years. And uh, just I'd like to draw your attention that one of the possibilities to commemorate his uh, 100th anniversary uh, may be uh, to discuss his legacy in this field. What I plan to do in the session, uh, The Universe of Andrei Sakharov, at the first electronic conference on the universe in February. And it may be one of possible platforms for such discussions, though I think there will be many other events for science. So uh, thank you for attention. Thank you very much for this nice presentation and thank you for being exactly in time. So we have a time for some questions, please, if there is anyone who wants to ask a question. Okay, I see that Grigory Verchagin wrote in the chat, antibiotics can interact with cosmic rays, supernova remnants, etc. Are there any constraints? Uh, thank you for this uh, uh, nice question. Uh, uh, yes, uh, uh, it, it is just... Uh, 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 not only antibiotics can interact with cosmic rays, they can interact with matter, uh, gas, and that puts constraint on the amount of antimatter in our galaxy because just the uh, pollution by antibaryons uh, uh, of the galaxy would lead to annihilation of um, dominant antiprotons with uh, uh, matter, and uh, uh, it uh, uh, can uh, uh, give uh, uh, the possibility to. Um, uh, uh, he put constraints by gamma ray background, uh, uh, as I demonstrated, but very briefly and quickly uh, on my slides. Uh, we can reproduce in this way for the uh, amount of uh, antimatter about uh, 100,000 solar masses. Uh, we can uh, roughly estimate the uh, gamma ray background, which should appear, and uh, it corresponds in the 10 hundred mv range to what uh, uh, was observed. However, we cannot say that it proves uh, antimatter because any source of phi zero gives you the same thing. So <laughs> actually, the uh, combination of different constraints certainly put uh, a constraint on this hypothesis, but it is something what is uh, uh, just... Uh, uh, I need some proof, and uh, well, my 
intention is to be prepared to the result which will be given by the uh, IMF too. Uh, and uh, uh, so I just... Uh, 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 <laughs> and we, we just tried to approach from the theoretical uh, side. Thanks. Thank you very much for this nice presentation. So if there is no any other question, we'll, we thank again uh, Maxim Kropov for this nice presentation. And once more, we thank all the speakers from this afternoon session. And uh, I think this is the end, Gregory. Yes, there is no any more presentation today. Yes, correct. Okay, very good. So, bye everyone. See you tomorrow morning. Thanks for this. Thank nice you session. very much for a very nice uh, uh, <laughs> mediation <laughs> of this session. <laughs> and you, Grigory, for all. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think the, this is the long program of the of Tuesday. We will have uh, Thursday tomorrow morning, and uh, we will start with Nikolai Shakura uh, at nine thirty. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, See you tomorrow. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Thank you. Goodbye.